Back. Let's turn to our media panel now. This week, listener columnist Bill Ralston and New Zealand On Screen Contact Director Irene Gardner. Good morning to you both. So, the end came for David Shearer this week after a fishy performance in the House. Does he think it's fair that a commercial fisher can catch a snapper as small as 25 centimetres, but a recreational fisher has to go to 36? Is that fair? Let's look at to a comment David Shearer made on First Line. And I suggested his electorate didn't think he was tough enough. Look, I don't put, put my, uh, my hard ass on the line and, and, and show it, but believe me, behind the scenes I am. Then this week he perhaps unwisely accused the Prime Minister of not working with Labour on the GCSB bill, when in fact, of course, there had been secret meetings between Key and Shearer. My request that he should remember that. I asked Mr. Uh, Mr. Shearer if he'd like to come to my office to have a discussion. We sat down and had about a 30 minute discussion where Mr. Shearer said, keep this confidential. In the course of that discussion, did he say to me that he didn't really care whether we supported it or not because he already had Peter Dunn over the line? Uh it's been a very interesting week, uh, certainly in politics. Bill Ralston, we've talked earlier this morning about whether it was David Shearer who failed or whether it was the team around him. Certainly Stuart Nash has said he thinks Shearer was getting some pretty bad advice. Yep, and he's nominated uh, Fran Mould for the first one, um, you know, to ba basically go overboard. I think Shearer was getting bad advice. He was an inexperienced politician, still is an ex inexperienced politician. Uh, it, the the advisers around him had a duty to really keep him on track. They failed to do so. But what did Shearer in more than anything else was that explosive um, break in the House that he'd actually had a secret meeting with Key. What was he thinking? Presumably his own staff didn't even know when he, jack when he jacked up that question. Weird. It's a twofold thing though, isn't it? Because I think Bill and Stuart are right. I think he hasn't had the best in advice, both in a general sense and in a media handling sense. But in the end, he's the guy in the job. He's in the big top job. Aren't you responsible for who you pick to surround yourself and how clever they are and how helpful they are? I mean, you know, I'm pretty sure strong leaders like Helen Clark, John Cle Key, you know, pick pretty carefully who they surround themselves that, with. It brings us back to that question of whether, you know, press gallery journalists go on to make good, you know, you know, communications advisors. And I, I've always been intrigued by this because there's strategies that need to be put in place. And I'm not sure that that's every journalist's forte, you know, no. writing stories or working You're stories. You're quite right. Some journalists do make the transition yeah. and some, some do extremely well. Others don't. It's, um, it's a matter of simply, I don't know, finding, as you say, people who are capable of coming up with the strategy. It's too often journalists, and particularly in the press, Curry, find themselves simply reporting on what's going on. They're not the strategists. I, I know John Armstrong, for example, from the Herald. Um, you know, I think he would be a fantastic strategist. But whether you could actually nominate everyone else in the press gallery for that kind of role. Well, it takes a certain pragmatism, which some journalists have and some don't. Some get very caught up in the day-to-day -day minutiae mm -hmm. of things. And that's probably not what you need for that broader gig. Yeah, indeed. It's um, an interesting debate. OK, let, last week we talked about the now notorious interview between John Campbell and John Key over the GCSB bill. And this week, Irene, the New Zealand on-screen website has had uh, a lot of interest in some of the other great TV political stashes. Let's have a look. The producer of this programme told me today that he would give me the questions that would be asked so that I could confer with defence intelligence sources and give correct answers for the benefit of the people of this country. Prime Minister, I, I will not, I will not have some time. smart Alec interviewer changing the rules of the game halfway through, Mr Walker. You are the person who could lead that recovery back within your ranks because I believe that your party has an honourable tradition. And I think that there are people in it who are prepared to be part of that recovery. Thank you. I give them after July 15 the chance to do that. Thank you very much, Mr. I Lani. love you, Mr. Lani. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I respectfully uh, reserve the right to disagree with you, and I have to run now. So I'd like to thank you very much for having me on your show. I would like to uh, wish you luck in the future, and sure look forward to being down here with the New Zealand uh, people and their upcoming fabulous event. Thank you very much for having me. But would you be interested in apologising to Mr Farr in public, Mr Connor, for that incident that happened last year? Why didn't you tell no, us at the time? No, don't, don't go, why didn't you tell me anything? Why didn't I the government tell us? I am not running this issue. Why didn't the government I tell have... us? Why didn't your minister tell us, <laughs> Look, Marion Hobbs? Why didn't she tell us? If you want to set down... That's a fair a, question. If you want to That's set a down question. a set of questions about this, 
for a properly informed interview, I'm happy to do that. But I'm not going to be harangued on a set-up interview that I've had no advice on. Some uh, extraordinary interviews over the years there. Irene, lots of interest. It was just really funny. In the wake of the big Campbell PM interview, I come to work and I look in our little most viewed section and suddenly all of those have jumped into most viewed. It's made people interested in them. Um, the I love you, Mr. Longy moment in the 1984 <laughs> leaders debate. That's not a stoush, that one, like the other three that we just saw. But that was a real classic game changer moment when Longy said, I, I love you. Uh, sorry, when Muldoon said, I love you, Mr. Longy to Longy. And a lot of people picked up on, you know, the moment in uh, the Campbell interview where he said the thing about, I can't remember the exact words, but you're a brilliant prime politician, Prime Minister. Yes, that's right. People thought it was that same sort of moment mm. in an interview, that, mm. that moment of change. But yeah, it's so great seeing them all in a little montage. Um, and yeah, I, I do think, as you see Corngate, the famous Corngate yes. from 2002 at the end there, and I, I think people now that time has passed think that uh, Helen Clark didn't handle that well because she lost her temper. Whereas I think with the key one, he stayed calm mm. and that was the difference in terms of, you know, maybe John Campbell not, not besting him. Yep. Um, and you would probably remember the very first one that we saw there from 1976, Mr Muldoon and Simon Walker. I do. Having I a right old ding dong. Indeed, <laughs> indeed. Um, interesting to see that, um, you know, John Key uh, in his interview managed, as you say, Calm. Calm stayed on top. The minute someone loses their temper, normally they lose. I think that's part of the advice he gets. Be dignified, be the guy who could be the neighbour mowing the lawns and yep. flipping the sausages, and he's always very calm and never looks rattled, really, does he? Yeah, I think, you know, Key is not someone who actually needs that much political advice mm. anymore, by and large. I think he gets together with two or three of the, uh, the inner cabinet and they have a little discussion. Um, but I don't think there's a lot of uh, people talking in his ears. No, no, quite. OK, TV3 Current Affairs programme Third Degree uh, had yet another story about the Tainer Porter case. Reporter Paula Penfold and producer Eugene Bingham have exposed some serious doubt about this man's conviction. Here's a clip from Wednesday night's programme. Somebody needs to do something about it. This is at the very beginning of January 1988. You gave the police Malcolm Rewa's name. Yep, yeah, this was literally within a week of the attack. They knew who it was. So this, of course, relates to Malcolm Rewa, uh, who went on to become a serial rapist and some of the women who uh, had been raped by Rewa gave his name to police early on and their, you know, uh, evidence, if you like, was never checked. Malcolm Rewa's alibi was never checked yep. either. Does the show, Bill, that, I guess, investigative journalism really has a part to play yeah, in justice. Dead. It's not dead it's not, is it? No. Look, I think this story is, is going to be very much like um, uh, Pat Booth and, you know, um, with... Uh, Arthur Allen Thomas, mm. I think we're going to actually see the um, uh, portal walk free at some point and um, hopefully the police go back and look at what they did at that stage mm. to ensure something like that can never happen again with the rework. Yeah, and Judith Collins has been fairly strong about, you know, the correct paths to follow, but there seems to be a little bit of movement here. It's quite extraordinary, isn't it? It is extraordinary and I, I am I such credit to... Um, Paula Penfold and Eugene Bingham. I think the series of stories on Tina Pora and now moving into Malcolm Brewer and his victims, I think it's been the television journalism of the year. They've done an amazing job uh, and it is getting some results now. And as Bill said, we have a great tradition actually of some miscarriage of mm. justice journalism. You know, uh, Pat Booth on Thomas, uh, Donna Chisholm on David Doherty. Mm. And, you know, I think this is going to follow in that pattern. But I did also want to just credit Phil Taylor in the New Zealand Herald yes. has been doing the story for a long time, yeah. very, very, very well. Doesn't get the notice as you do when you get it onto television. Mm -hmm. And I, I presume actually Third Degree probably picked it up from that work. And he's done some great work as well. Yes, so yeah, you just credit where it's too. due. Absolutely. It, it, it's been an amazing piece of um, journalism all round. OK, and I just want to show you this week um, when David Shearer was coming at the airport, coming through the airport just after he'd resigned. He wasn't speaking, of course. All the media went out to try and front foot him and get an interview with him. Here's, what's hap here's what happened at the airport. Here we are. Mr. Mr. 
Radio Live sent us that little video, Bill. Uh, it goes to show the cheering there when the cameramen all fall over. It's appalling. I mean, you know, that just shows you what the public think of uh, journalists in New Zealand. Also interesting watching Rebecca Wright we sort of wind her way in yeah. front. Like a sheepdog. I know. She's yeah. just zigzagged. As Getting him off at the pass. Yeah. I know. But, uh, but that's, that's, that's the, uh, well, the risk you run, I suppose, with those kind of things. Four stitches, I think, our cameraman Chris Ooh. Jones ended up with Ooh. in his elbow. All right, Bill Ralston and Irene Gardner, thank you.